Okay, well, we're going to get started here. Um, first of all, can I ask you a question? Is, are you getting something out of this series? Yes. I mean, is it helping? Yes. Remember, it, it goes back to, and I know it's the simplest thing, but you know, sometimes the simplest things hold a real massive revelation. When God told me, you know you don't trust somebody you don't know, oh my gosh. People struggle with faith so much, you know? I can remember praying, Lord, I, 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 I have faith in you, I just don't have faith in my faith. Uh, that's, that, I, you know, that's what I told him, I said, you know, um, and the, the disciples asked to increase our faith, right? So they knew the problem wasn't God, it was them, you know? And so um, to, to, to understand that the key to having faith in God is getting to know God. It really is. Amen? Getting to know God and, and then taking on his nature. You know, um, it, it's just, it's really opened up a lot to me. And I'm hoping that it, it does the same for you. Um, I know that we'll naturally grow by more knowledge of God. Amen? We'll naturally grow more. I know that life throws a lot at us, especially right now, because I watch the news, I see what's going on in the world, and it seems like the world has gone insane. It just seems like the whole world has gone insane, okay? Uh, China's getting ready to attack uh, Taiwan, and, and the war in the Middle East is, is spooling up, and Iran's got a nuke now, and, and you know, and, and who knows what, right? Um, Civil unrest, disease, and a lot of people don't know how to cope. They don't, you know. Uh, when I'm out in the community and I'm talking to people, I have gotten more positive res responses, if you will, to reaching out to people than I've ever gotten before. And why is that? The, the gospel I'm preaching hasn't changed. I haven't changed. It's the fact that they're more receptive because, again, people are looking for answers, right? They're looking for answers. And when you display what God is doing for you, when I mean display, in other words, they can see there's a peace inside of you, you know? There's, a, there's a, a, an assurance inside of you. I know for a fact that myself, my family, we're all gonna be just fine. We are. No matter what happens, we're gonna be fine. Amen? So, again, it comes back to to knowing that God has his eyes on us. There's a scripture that says, God is saying, my eyes are searching throughout the whole earth for someone that I can show myself strong on their behalf. Yeah. I've read that scripture to you before, right? You find that in 2 Chronicles 16, I'll read it to you. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. Now stop there for a second, to show, to, to show. There's a purpose behind what he's doing. There's a pur he's searching. Why? Because he wants to do something. He wants to show himself strong on your behalf. Yeah. What does that mean, he wants to show yourself strong? If you dissect this down, in other words, he wants you to know. If I'm going to show you something, it's because I want you to get it. Right? And what he's saying is, I want you to get this. I'm strong on your behalf. I want to show you this so you can be reassured and comforted that I am strong on your behalf. I mean, if you start looking at this stuff and then meditating on these scriptures that I've been sharing with you for the last few weeks, you begin to really see the heart of God and the love of God. And, and we can mentally assert, okay, yeah, I know God loves me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only God. Okay, I got that. But you've got to get it from here down into here, and the only way you do that is to really meditate it and let it soak into you. Amen? And so that's what we've been doing, right? We've been letting it soak into us, right? Um, again, I, I started down this path uh, teaching about the anointing, teaching about the Holy Spirit, and how the Holy Spirit's job is to teach us to be conformed into the image of Christ so that we can be partakers of his divine nature, okay? And, and in studying about the nature of God, I was drawn to uh, a following scripture I'm going to read to you in just a second. But when I read that, it just, again, it was one of those revelation moments that exploded inside my brain, right? And, and so I want to read it to you again. 
John 14, 13, and whatever you ask in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you remember, I said that he's not talking about his name Jesus. That was a common name, like Fred, George, Bill, whatever, right? That was a common name. He's not talking about his name. He's talking about his character. If you look that word up there when it says name, it's actually talking about an identifier, who he is as, a, as a, his character, his nature. So what he's saying there is, if you can get to know me and know my nature, know my character, know my values, and take on those same value systems inside yourself, then when you ask something in my name according to those values, I'm going to do it. Right? Amen? Amen. And so, that's, that's, so, so if I'm going to do that, then that means I have to know what his values are, I have to know his nature, I have to study it, get to know him, which is all tied together with the thing I'm saying, right? So that I can, in turn, I would love to get to the point where when I pray, the answer is there. Wouldn't you love that? Wouldn't you love that? You know, uh, it's, it's pretty dismal, if you think about it, the percentage of our prayers that we get answered in our life, honestly. Come on, let's be honest, right? We pray and we pray and we pray, and a lot of times it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, or it takes forever. And there's a lot of reasons why, I, I can't get into all that today. But the point again simply is a lot of times we sabotage our own prayers by our actions or lack of actions, right? And so, again, it, it, if we can take on the nature of Christ, our actions will change, and those actions, when they change, will stop sabotaging the prayers we're praying. Does that make sense? Yes. Absolutely. So, um, it's obvious that, that God... Um, wants us to, to be um, to transformed into the image of his dear son. Watch 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. In other words, being taught by the Spirit of the Lord. So when we get into the Word of God, it becomes a mirror to us. It shows us his face. It shows us his image, who he is. And by doing that and reading that and meditating on it, we begin to take that on ourselves. You have noticed if you hang around somebody long enough, you start to act like they do? Yeah, we do. We, we take on our, our, our environment. We really do. You hang around, you know, there's a, a saying, um, bad company uh, um, um, perverts good morals or something like that. Remember that saying? Sure. So birds of a feather flock together. Yeah. So again, so if you hang around Jesus, you'll begin to start thinking like he does, acting like he does. And that's, of course, is what we're trying to do, right? So, again, you don't trust somebody you don't know, and that's where our path has been. We're on getting to know Jesus. Amen? So the first thing we saw about Jesus, or about God, is that he is love. 1 John 4, 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. So not only do we identify that God is love, we have to also see that if, if, we're, if the aim is to know God, a good gauge is how much do we love. Because it says there, if you don't love, then you don't know God, which means that to know God, you have to be knowing love, right? Makes sense, right? So how much do you struggle with loving people? How much do you struggle with hatred and bitterness and anger? See, those things are contrary to love. So if you're struggling in those areas, then you need to get to know God more, right? So how do I get to know love, love uh, know God more, or love God, excuse me, how do I get to love God more? The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. So if you need to increase in your love, the best way to do that is to start reading over and over again scriptures that, that proclaim God's love for you, because it'll change your heart. It'll change your heart. Amen? And I can't get into all that again, too, because I'd be in forever talking about all the sermons I just preached, so we'll go on. But, um, but then also, and I didn't put this up there, but 1 John 4.20 tells us that if we're going to love God, we have to love our brother also. Now it's getting a little more complicated. But turn that around for a second. That means that if you are going to say, you love God, you have to love me. 
or if someone else in your, fa in your life, family, friends, whatever, are gonna say they love God, they have to love you. So what's God saying? If you wanna say you love me, you gotta love my family, you know? I mean, the example I gave, if you came to me and said, hey, you know what, Pastor Mike, I really love you, but I hate your family, <laughs> you know? It, we have a problem, right? Um, our relationship's not very good. Because if you, if you say you love me and you hate my family, I mean, where, where do we do with that, right? So we, we chuckle at that and laugh at that, but that's what God's saying. You can't say you love me if you don't love my family. You know? And so if you don't love my family, you don't, you don't know me very well yet either. Okay? So, so anyway, I, I was on this path a few years ago, and... I was, I was you know, trying to get to know God more. I said, God, I want to know you more. I know I read the word, okay, I get that, but, but, but I want you to mentor me. How do I get to know you more, right? And so I was having this conversation with God, and this was over a, a few days, it wasn't just one day. So he started downloading things to me, and I've been sharing that with you. The first one he said is that you can tell a lot about a person by what gives them pleasure. And I, I taught a sermon on that, I'm not getting into the scriptures, but if you understand what gives somebody pleasure, you begin to start to understand them, right? And the scripture says that God, it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So there's a lot of scriptures that talk about that. You can research them or go online and watch the video. So, and the second, second thing he told me is you can tell a lot about a person by what excites them. Well, the Bible is filled with scriptures that talk about God's excitement over you. God's excitement over you, right? There's one scripture that says he's so excited over you that he jumps up on his throne and spins and dances, you know? And the other one says that he grabs you and holds you in his arms like a mother with their child, right? And sings over you with such emotion that if it were us doing that, we'd have so much emotion that it would cause us to get hoarse. Because there's so much into our emotion. And that's what God's doing. He loves you so, he gets excited over you so much. Then another one he told me, he said, you can tell a lot about a person by what they watch by what they watch. If I was to look over your shoulder at everything you're looking at and everything you're watching, especially online, right? Um, I would get to know you. I'd get to know you really well. By, and so, and the Bible says that his eyes are watching over the whole earth to see who he could find to, to, to help. Amen? So his eyes are on us all the time. The next one he said to me is, you can tell a lot about a person by what they listen to. And the Bible says he hears our cry. He's listening for our cry, amen? So those are things he's trying to show me that if I look in those scriptures, that I'll begin to understand him. What is his focus on in life? What is, what is his focus? His focus, what, is his, what gives him pleasure? What excites God? What's, what excites God, amen? His children excite God, amen? You know, um, for the last two weeks, I've hardly seen any of my grandkids and it's because they've been sick and stuff, and they, one family's sick, and then the other family's sick, and they, they share, right? So I haven't seen my grandkids in like a couple of weeks almost, it seems, right? Man, I miss them. I miss them, right? Did you imagine what God goes to? He misses us, you know? The times that we could spend in time in prayer, and, and we don't, we don't spend time with him, you know? Um, you know, I, I talk to God, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty open with God. I'm pretty blunt, if you will, sometimes with God. And, and one time I was praying and, and just talking to God and said, God, you know, I know I need to pray more, but praying gets pretty boring. You know what he said? He says, what do you think you're doing right now? See, yeah, if you, if you look at prayer as, as petition, okay, I got to get this list down down the list or something like that, or, oh, I gotta, you know, pray for an hour in the spirit, or, or I've gotta, you know, and I, I, I gotta pray, you know, you know. You imagine if, if your spouse comes to you and says, uh, we, we need to spend time together, so um, let me just get my stopwatch out, click okay, we got 15 minutes. Johanna would go, wow, I feel blessed. You know, you know, is it a chore? Well, here's the thing that'll help you with your prayer life, okay? Just sit and talk. Just sit and talk to him. Don't look at it as in prayer. Look at it as I'm just talking to you, God. And you can do that all day long, yeah. right? Maybe that'll help somebody, right? So anyway, so, and then the, the last one, I, the last week I shared is you know a person, uh, 
you have to listen to what they're saying, what they're saying. And so he took me to scriptures where he himself was saying something, not just people teaching about him, but where the Lord said, thus saith the Lord, and things like that. And when Isaiah was in the throne room, the voice of the Lord thundered and shook the entire place. That, that was just shaking, it was so scary, right? But then also on the mountain, when God spoke, it was a still small voice. And what I, what I get out of listening to what God is saying is no matter what God is saying, whether he's loud or small, silent voice, it's always filled with power. God's voice is always filled with power. Whenever he's speaking, believe me, all the power of heaven is behind it. Amen? So, so what is God saying? Jeremiah 31, 1, I want to read this to you. It says this, and, and, when, and you know, when I read this passage, he was speaking to the Jewish people back then, but if you think about it, if you look at what it's saying here, it's pretty much kind of speaking to them right now, too, with what they're going through. Jeremiah 31, 1, and when that happened, that God's decree... It will be plain as the sun at high noon. I will be the God of every man, woman, and child in Israel, and they shall be my very own people. This is the way God put it. They, they found grace out in the desert, these people who survived the killing, Israel, out looking for a place to rest, met God out looking for them. God told them, I've never quit loving you and never will. Expect love, love, and more love. Well, that isn't just for the Jewish people because we're the seed of Abraham. See, all the promises that God made to, this, to, the, to the, the, uh, the nation of Israel actually was made to the seed of Abraham. And the Bible teaches us that we are now the seed of Abraham. So everything God promised them, he is promising us too. Amen? And so everlasting love, it's not a, a, a momentary impulse. This is a commitment from God to love. Amen? And so I want to ask you, have you found grace? I mentioned that earlier. Have you found grace in your life? That's the important part. You know, you might say, I'm going through a hard time right now. I don't really feel God. That's okay. It says that grace was found in the desert. Oftentimes, grace is found in the desert when you're going through stuff. That's when you need the grace of God. You know, don't mistake grace for forgiveness or mercy. Those are two different things. Grace is the God's ability to help you overcome. That's what grace is. That's why the Lord said to Paul, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. It's an overcoming uh, ability, if you will. So, yeah, they found grace. It was out in the desert. So if you're going through some things, you know what? That's the time to really expect God to pour out his grace on you. Amen? That's when they found it. And it says that God sought them out. God sought them out. When a little child is crying, there's something in them that knows that, that if mom can hear me, she's coming. She's on her way. God says, my ear is in tune to you. So when you're going through something, you have to understand he's already on his way. He hastens to perform his word. He's already on his way. He found them in the desert. They were crying out. He found them. Believe me, he knows where you are. Amen. St. Augustine said it this way. He said, grace is given not because we have done good works, but in order that we may be able to do them. That's what grace is. Grace is found in the desert the minute we take a step in the right direction. God stoops down, picks us up, and runs with you. That's what he does. King James says it this way, it's the same scripture though, he says, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, an unfailing love have I drawn you to myself. God will draw you to him. You have to expect these things. And here's the thing, I understand that in this process right here, you're weak. In this process, you don't have the strength to seek out God. You have to just rest and say, okay, God, I know you're seeking out me. There have been times in my life where I just sit there and say, God, I, I'm too... I'm too tired to pray. I don't want to pray. I'm too tired to do anything except sit right here. I need you. I need you. Because there's times in my life I've went through hell. But I know that he was there and he sustained me and took me through it and brought me out on the other side. Yes. Amen. Amen. 
We always look and look back, hopefully, and see that God was doing something that at the time we couldn't see. Amen? Amen. I wrote this down. God's grace is simply another word for God's tumbling, rumbling reservoir of strength and protection. It comes at us not occasionally or miserly, but constantly and aggressively, wave upon wave. Wave upon wave. Grace is the gift of feeling sure that our future, even our dying, is going to turn out more splendidly than we ever imagined. I am totally convinced of God's goodwill toward me, no matter what happens in my life. If I die tonight, to die is gain. What can you do to a person that's not afraid of dying? Right? I want to go back to a scripture I read a couple weeks ago, Psalms 34, 15, and I've kind of quoted this a couple times already. It says this, says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. What you see here is, is, is God, you, you can see what God, how God is by what he's focused on. And his eyes are focused, like I said, on you, on you. So the next thing God told me then, is what I want to talk about today. He says, you know a person by how they treat others. Or how, the, how they treat the lowly, especially the lowly. How do they treat the lowly, Right? I remember one person, a minister I know, he says when he was interviewing somebody to hire on in his ministry, he would take them to a restaurant and watch how they treat the waitress. Do they treat the waitress with respect or do they treat them like them some sort of a servant? If they're rude to the waiter or waitress, they won't hire them because that's how they'll treat the rest of his staff, right? Um, you, you get to know somebody by how they treat others. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7 says this, The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. That's how God treats the lowly. That's how God treats the lowly. I want to tell you a story about a lady. We're going to read the passage here, and we'll get to know her a little bit better. Luke chapter 8, verse 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitude thronged him. Now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood was stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter... And those with him said, Master, the multitude strong and press you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Stop there for a second. You can touch Jesus, or you can touch Jesus. There were people physically touching him. He's not saying that. He's not even talking about the power going out. Somebody touched him. Somebody touched him. I look at it this way, somebody touched his heart. She might have touched his garment with her hand, but she touched his heart with her faith. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Go in peace. Let me describe this woman to you. Middle-aged. That's how I see her. Middle-aged. Her hair is streaked with gray in obvious pain. She's wearing a long robe that hides who she is and what she's going through. She's trying to be inconspicuous as she can be. Doesn't even want anybody to notice her. Now there's another reason, it's because she's unclean. She's unclean. She has an issue of blood. When a woman was on her period back then, she was considered unclean, and this woman had been on one for 12 years. And as an unclean person, she could not have any interaction with other people. 
She couldn't touch them and they couldn't touch her or they would become unclean also. To deliberately cause someone to become unclean was punishable by stoning. She was risking her life to push through that crowd. This is how desperate she was. She thought if she could just sneak up behind Jesus and touch the hem of his garment, not him, just, just the hem of his garment, he would, make, he would make her clean without making him unclean. And so she tries. Any effort you do to reach out to God will not go unnoticed by God. Any effort will not go unnoticed by God. And you definitely can't reach out and touch him and not receive. You can't. She found that out. So here she is, 12 years she's been unclean. Think about it now. She had been wealthy, spent all of her money trying to get healed. And for a woman to have wealth back then, she had to be married. Women weren't allowed to have money, okay? Um, unless they were, you know, her husband had died or whatever, you know. She probably had kids, okay? And she's been unclean for 12 years. She hasn't touched her children for 12 years. Hasn't touched her babies in 12 years. Not able to hold her babies. She hasn't been touched by her husband in 12 years. No intimacy. There had to be a strain on the marriage. And in that culture, when someone, especially a woman, has a disease like that, she's considered cursed by God. Looked down upon. She probably had friends at one time, but one by one they abandoned her. She had no honor, no dignity, no hope, except one. Jesus. So she takes a chance and she reaches out and catches the attention of God. Remember Psalms 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. Jesus felt power leave him in spite of the crowd pressing in, in spite of the urgency of Jairus' need to heal his daughter. Jesus stops this woman stopped God in his tracks. This woman stopped God in his tracks. I'm here to tell you, when you're crying out to God, you can stop him in your tracks. He loves you that much. And why did he stop in his tracks? There was, here's the thing, she'd already been healed, but he stopped anyway, why? There was more healing to come. There was more healing that she needed. You see, stopping the issue of blood wasn't the only need she had. It wasn't the only miracle she needed. There was more. Look at what happened. You, you have a very famous minister on a mission, Jesus, a crowd of people all wanting his attention, a very prominent <coughs> public figure with a dying daughter. The disciples obviously stressed out, you know, from the demands of ministry, and then Jesus stops and ignores all of them for her. He could have acknowledged her healing and kept on walking. I'm glad you got healed, but he didn't. He patiently listens while she told her story. He patiently listened. Sometimes people need you to just listen. Sometimes you need somebody to talk to you so they'll just listen. He patiently listened as she told her story, how she'd become sick, how she'd suffered many things. Some doctors had made her try to stop the bleeding. She spent all of her money in vain. And I'm surmising here, of course, I'm, I'm coloring the picture in a little bit, but she told him of the anguish of not touching her children, not being able to give her kids a hug the marriage problems, the abandonment of friends, the judgmental attitude of the priest, and the pain of being an outcast. And Jesus just listened, and then he washed it all away. He washed it all away with one word. One word that he spoke. Do you see it there? Do you see it? One word that he spoke. Daughter. 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 Nowhere else in scripture 
does Jesus call a woman daughter? He would call them by their name or he would, call, he would say woman. He never ever called anybody daughter except this woman right here. It's the only place. That honor was reserved for someone who had suffered so much. Someone who had had her honor stripped away. Someone who had been forsaken by everybody she knew, but not by God. Jesus wanted to heal more than just her body. He wanted to heal her heart. You see, a miracle healed her body. His kindness healed her dignity. His kindness healed her dignity. And I can hear her testifying. And if he hadn't have done enough already, her eyes watering, he called me daughter. Never has he ever called anyone daughter but me. The kindness of Jesus. That's how God treats the lowly. That's how you can get to know God. How does he treat the lowly? Could you imagine what she does after that? Running as fast as she can to the priest to, to get a confirmation of her healing, because that's what they would have to do, and then running to her family and grabbing those kids. If we were standing there watching, we'd all be crying like babies. Yeah. <laughs> we would watching this woman hug her kids for the first time in 12 years. There's another person I want you to, to, to get to know. We'll read about him and then I'll share his story. Matthew 8, verse 1. And when he had come down from the mountain, Jesus, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing be cleansed. Immediately his, lepers, his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. I wrote, I read this years ago now, and I felt compelled to write a short story about this gentleman. And so I'm going to read you that's okay, this short story about, about this man. His name is Pete, Peter. His age is 27 years old. He's married. His wife's name is Rachel. Two children, Natasha, who is seven, and Lori, who is five. Oh, and, and one on the way, one on the way. Pete is in the first century Israel, Jerusalem to be exact, there are no paved roads, no cars, no telephones. The summer air is filled with the dust that has been stirred up by thousands of feet walking about the city. It's quite hot on this particular day, uncomfortably, uncomfortably so. This man looks and acts like just about every other man on the street that day, but this day would change his life forever. As you stand looking at this man walking down this dusty, busy street, let me tell you something about him. You might, you might be able to surmise by the large sack on his back full of bread that he's a baker. He bakes many loaves a day and sells them at the market to support his wife and two sh small children, two daughters. They live in a small house in Jerusalem on the west side of town, not far from the wall that separates the city from the garbage heap in the Hinnon Valley. Not a bad little neighborhood, although it's a bit noisy with all the traffic. And on certain days, you can really smell the valley just over the wall. It can be nauseating at times. Nevertheless, it's his home, and he feels comfortable there. He had not always dreamed about being a baker, although his good customers always complimented him and, 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 and commented that he's a natural at it. Somehow, somehow or another, life just seemed to move him in that vocation, and he didn't dislike it. There are other bakers at the market each day, some of them out of town, some of them from nicer parts of Jerusalem, and one or two are from his side of town. All have their own secrets, their own way of making bread. He's no different. He takes great pride in his work. It gives him a sense of purpose. He provides for his own, and it feels good to him. So this, is, this is Pete's life. Each day as he works, when he has a spare moment, he thinks of home and his wonderful little family. Oh, his wife, Rachel. She's the most beautiful thing in the world to him. He dreams of her all the time. The smell of her hair and clothes, her kiss, 
her embrace. He counts himself truly blessed for having such a woman. No man ever loved a woman more than he loves his wife. And his daughters, what a joy they bring him. The older of the two is rather high-spirited. She has a mind all of her own and does not hesitate to say what she's thinking about. Definitely the tomboy of the two. The younger is more pensive. One never knows what she's thinking, but she's always thinking. Each day as he returns home from the market, he can always count on them running to greet him with smiles and kisses. Somehow that makes the hardships of the day melt away. This day, the dusty, busy, hot day, is not unlike any other day. He rounds a corner into a street. He hears the shrieks of, Daddy's home, followed by hugs and kisses and a million questions about what he saw in town today. As the man and his daughters make their way home in a glow of the late afternoon sun, he steps to the door of his home, his home and the smell of a delicious dinner. He can bake just fine, but nobody cooks like his wife does. They sit down and after giving thanks, eat dinner, just like every other night, nothing unusual, nothing particular. It's an absolutely normal, uneventful evening around the table. Watch the man now. Watch him get up from the table and walk over to his wife. He whispers a few words of gratitude to her, and he gives her a gentle kiss. Each catches the other's eyes, and their brief gaze speaks a thousand volumes of affection. But what they cannot know in that moment is it would be the last such glance, the last such kiss, the last such moment for a very long time. She rises from the table, begins cleaning up, walks to the water basin to do the same. He washes his hands, ponders about the events of the day, and anticipates another such day tomorrow. But what's that? There in the water. Can it be? Blood. What's coming from, where's it coming from, the man wonders. Has he cut himself somehow without knowing it? No, there's no cuts. Then why is there blood? He slowly rolls his hands around trying to discover the source of the bleeding while all of them, the while wondering. Could it be? Oh God, please don't let it be. Blood seems to be pouring right out through his skin now. Small openings appear where none had been before. He tries not to show his panic, but it's too late. Out of the corner of his eye, he notices his wife. Her pale face says what she's too, that she too was wondering if it could be. Could it possibly be? Please, God, no, she thinks. Once again, they stare at each other's eyes, this time in a sense of fear rather than love and security. In a voice that's nearly a whisper, he tells her to go quickly. Just take the girls and go. We'll find out tomorrow. The next day, the priest puts the man in confinement in a safe place away from the people outside the city wall, not far from his home, near the city dump. The waiting is intolerable. Now, besides smelling the burning garbage, he has to watch it day and night. Seven days later, he's called before the priest who again examines him. Then the nightmare really begins as he's declared permanently unclean, leprosy. Why? What did I do to deserve this? God, couldn't you just have killed me? Must I be tortured like this? Is this really necessary? God, where are you? Listen to him, watch him. Pete's world had just come crashing down around him. For the next few years, go from bad to worse. He's lost his livelihood, his family, his home, his friends, even his religion. He has nothing except the, the, the sliver of a conscience that keeps him from taking his own life. His clothes are rags that he has managed to gather from the trash heap. They hang loosely on him to ease the pain of the open wounds that have covered his entire body. Tending those wounds now takes the place of kneading his bread. It gives him something to do with his time. After a while, it becomes second nature to him. He hardly notices himself wrapping his arms and legs each day. But he does notice that he must dig through the garbage for his food. He and other lepers, he hates that title, it's so dirty, unclean. He longs for the taste of fresh baked bread once more, but it will never be. Yet even the indignity of eating garbage doesn't compare to that of having to warn others of his presence. Somebody's coming, the other lepers would yell. Quickly, he covers his face almost in perfect unison with the rest of them, and they all start yelling, unclean, unclean. Children would recoil, would recoil in horror at the sight of him. Mothers would grab them and run for safety. 
The same people he had seen day after day in the market spoken to, done business with, would go out of their way to stay away from him. One day he was digging through the garbage by himself when he heard a cry, unclean, go up from the distance. He looked up and he saw her. It was Rachel. He was off the regular path so he didn't say anything for fear of scaring her away. He just sat down low and quiet and watched. She was as beautiful as ever, but she seemed sad and a little aged since he last kissed her. She had been through so much. If only he could have been there when she gave birth to their son. If only he could hold his son and they could gaze into each other's eyes as only proud parents could. His heart began to beat as she drew nearer. Oh, just to touch her again. Not since dinner that night so long ago had anyone ever touched him. He could almost feel her caress on his face. He thought for a moment he could smell her breath. He was sure that she would hear his heart beating in his chest. It was so loud and strong. Then she turned and began walking back toward the city and disappeared through the gate. That was the last time he saw her. He wiped the tears from his eyes only to have his hand covered in blood uh, from the sores on his cheeks. I wish I could die, he thinks to himself. Several months later, word begins to spread about a prophet who was in the area. They called him the Lamb of God. That sounded so clean, but who is he? Crowds follow this prophet everywhere. Even the lepers follow at a safe distance. He speaks with compassion and authority. One day, a particularly hot day, the man noticed the crowd following the prophet up to the Mount of Olives. He has heard that this man can cast out demons and heal the sick. Maybe, no, don't, don't think about it, the man says to himself, but he follows. As he comes to within earshot of the man, he is nearly choked by the dust and heat. He is reminded of another such day years ago of his bakery, his street, his children, his home, and his wife. This day, in many respects, is just like that day. As the prophet speaks, the crowd goes quiet, such a large number of people, and so quiet, the man thinks. Even though he's at a distance, he can hear the prophet saying, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's not possible. Does he see me from way over there? Can he know me in such a large crowd? Surely not, but, but maybe. Again, he speaks, do not think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come to not abolish them, but to fulfill them. Can any man really fulfill the law? Daring for the first time in years to hope, the man asked himself, can he do what has not been done since the days of Naaman and Elisha? Not since he saw his beautiful wife has his heart raced like this now racing. If only he could be healed. If this prophet, this Lamb of God can do, can, can do that, I can go home again. As the day drags, the people sit and listen intently to the words of the prophet. The man on the edge of the crowd waits patiently. Finally, the prophet finishes and begins to walk down the mountain. As the crowd moves to make way for him to pass through, the other lepers begin to shout, unclean, and run to escape contact with the normal people, except one. Risking what little he had left in life, he pushed through the crowd to find the prophet. This man can help. When he finally reached Jesus, he falls at his feet and weeps, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. A gasp was heard throughout the crowd. A leper dared talk to Jesus. How could they get this man to go away without touching him? They couldn't throw him out or drag him away or even pick him up off the ground. They looked to Jesus to discover his response. Then it happened. Who would have thought? Jesus reached out and actually touched the man. For years, no one had touched him. He had been forced to live in exile, stones thrown away, uh, uh, at him, away from his home and family, to live without a handshake of a friend, a kiss of a wife, to live on the edges of society until Jesus touched him when no one else would. Jesus touched him. Then the man looked up. Once upon a time, he had gazed into the eyes of his wife and there found love. Now he gazed in the eyes of the Messiah and found salvation. I am willing, he said, be clean. As Jesus helped the man to his feet, he wiped the tears from his eyes, and they were wet, covered with perfectly clear tears, unstained, untainted, clean. He cried out, he had cried out, cleanse me, and now he was. One touch was all it took, one act of compassion. Pete looked into the eyes of the man who had just given him his life back. And Jesus told Pete, go your way. Go your way. Small sentence, 
big ramification. Big ramification. Go your way. That man's life was his way. His entire life was his way. Go your, your way, man. Go back to your life. You bet. So Pete turns and just trolls away? No. No, he runs faster than he's ever ran in his life. First to the priest to be legally declared whole, then racing down the same street he had left so many years before, he hears, he hears the screams. Somebody had already told his wife while he was at the temple what had happened. The crowd clears the way. There's only one person running faster than he was that day. And there she was, carrying a small boy in her arms at the same time. No person nor demon this side of hell could have slowed her down. Overcome with emotion so strong they both thought that they would pass out, they kissed in public. Then he was holding his son for the first time. Then the girls were there, they couldn't keep up with mom, but now they were there. Just one touch was all it took to give a man back his life to give a family back their life again, just one touch. And the reason I told that story to you is because that's the heart of God. That's the heart of God, to restore your life. When Jesus said, I came to give life more abundantly, that's what he was talking about there. You know, there's so much lack of hope in the world and all it takes is for you or I, as a child of God, to reach out with the love and the compassion that Christ has. And you can change a person's entire life forever. Forever. When I read, when I read you know, the story of the leper, you have to understand, and see, that's the thing we do when we read the Bible. Oftentimes we see these stories, different places, and, and we see the facts. You see the facts, but there's far more involved in that person's life than just the facts of what happened there, you know? Is what, what was the person dealing with? What was, their, what was their, their, their struggles? What was going on in their heart, see? And Jesus came to give hope and give life, amen? And, and it's, it's things like this that exposes me to the heart of God. It's things like this that show me and make me so overwhelmed with how much God loves that um, there, I don't know if there's anything in life I, that I can't face, honestly. I've, after years of pursuing God and, suing, and pursuing his love and his knowledge, I am totally convinced of God's goodwill toward me, no matter what happens in my life. I will never ever judge God's um, faithfulness, his love, or anything else. I will never judge that based on my circumstances, ever. And you shouldn't either, amen? amen. Go ahead and stand up, guys. I hope, this, I hope this helped, I hope you didn't mind me sharing that story. Um, I wanted to color in this leper's life because I know that he was much more than just a leper. Yeah. Amen. He had a family. Right. Amen. Praise God. So, well, um, I want to pray for you. If you need prayer, go ahead. You can take that if you want. Thank you. Um, when I and this has nothing to do with the altar call, really, but I but I just I was going to say something earlier and then I didn't, but. Um, when I was in prayer this morning before church, I really felt an admonishment to parents, and, and so I just, and I don't, it wasn't based on anybody that's here or not here, it just, I got this before the church started, before anybody was here today, and, um, but the times we're living in right now, you have to be the example to your kids that you know you're supposed to be. No one can equip your kids to survive this world, if you will, to, 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 to be an overcomer in this world more than you can. The, the schools definitely aren't gonna do it, right? Even coming to church here and your kids being taught downstairs isn't enough. 
they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna follow you and your example. Amen. So I just really, and even if they're adult kids, I'm just saying, that's what God gave me this morning. I don't know why me. That's for somebody specifically here, or maybe it was just for me. But we have to be an example. Amen. You really honestly do, because they will follow what you do, not what you say. Amen.